as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. This is Court Psyops from the Cinema Psyops Podcast. Welcome to the Gangs of Hollywood Podcast. Hey gang, that's right, we are back. This is episode 7, and that sexy, sexy voice is, of course, my good friend and colleague on Legend Podcast Networks, the man who can claim to have produced and delivered more than 200 plus weeks of regular shows, Court PsyOps. How are you, sir? I'm excellent, and actually, I can claim to, that I have produced more than 238 at this point. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Just to be exact. And I know how much you like to be exact, like things like, you know, Japan and Hong Kong and all that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm a very meticulous and neat monster, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> for for anyone that hasn't listened to uh, Cinema Psyops, first off, shame on you. And secondly, uh, would you like to just give the folks a brief introduction to the, yourself and the show? Yeah, sure. Cinema Psyops is myself and my uh, hetero life mate, Matt. Um, We've been friends for an excessive amount of time. We met shortly after I moved to the town that I live in uh, now, which is Omaha, Nebraska, at a shitty call center job. And the shtick that you hear on the show is what we basically did to keep ourselves sane while still at that call center just talking about whatever. And it's evolved and evolved and evolved. And now we more or less just cover basically whatever shit i bought and haven't watched yet for like physical media wise (laughs) and uh my my buying habits uh get a little uh, well i i have compulsive issues because i do have ocd as well so i tend to just buy anything where i'm like hey i've heard that title i need to own it now and that's kind of how things get put onto the show (laughs) Mm. and the most recent run has been more than a little uh blue yeah we um we kind of got um I don't know how to really phrase it other than we had a listener who really wanted to hear us actually talking about adult films and particularly like some of the ones from the golden age whenever there was actually plot that was involved with everything that was going on with the actual sex in the movies and so that kind of got a wild hair up my ass and I've always been kind of interested in the actual sex exploitation exploitation genre of film and so it was something that we were really neglecting in talking about mostly because Matt can't refer to a woman's vagina usually without saying hoo ha dilly. <laughs> and he gets real uncomfortable with certain sexual uh, proclivities of other folks. Like he can't quite handle it. He's gotten better over time. And I think we've kind of numbed him to some of this stuff, but still, like food play really, really grosses him out and he gets real queasy with that and stuff like that. But, you know, and that's featured a lot more prominently and a lot more widely accepted mm. uh, as a sexual thing, I think, for most people than some of the other stuff that we've covered. But uh, we've been digging into some sexploitation very recently. And a lot of that has to do with um, trying to find the movies that I used to watch, like that would show up on USA Up all night in the mid to late 90s when I was a kid or HBO or Cinemax or anything like that. So we've been covering a lot of those kind of movies lately. And uh, we're going to be capping off the year, actually, with uh, pretty much the granddaddy of all sort of exploitation-y, sleazy, uh, big boobs and guns type films, which is Andy Sedaris's stuff. That's going to be how we end this year. Oh, that's a I, heck of a way to win the end of the year. Yeah, well, it's like, what, 13 or 14 movies that man yeah. produced in his lifetime? And all of them feature really large-breasted women shooting guns, so uh, I can't say no to that. Th- that that's a, a, a literally a doubleheader of win in my book. There is no two ways about it. <laughs> yeah, it's right up your alley, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Now, moving on from things that are up my alley and moving into another alley, maybe a deeper, darker alley, on this episode, we're going to be discussing one of the greatest action movies ever, 2011's The Raid. Now, I'm going to come out and say it, I freaking love this movie. (laughs) Yeah, when you were showing me the list of movies that were available and that you said some people were kind of filling up, I scrolled halfway down, saw the raid, scrolled the rest of the way through, and went, nope, 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 not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. And then I'm like, yeah, the raid, yeah, the raid. The raid. I th- it, took me, it took me like all of five seconds. I think I just quickly scanned the list and was like, yeah, we're doing the raid. Totally. Yeah. I want the raid. And nobody else can have this. Yeah, because th- this, uh, there's so much going on. But anyone, before I start gushing everywhere, let's go to the trailer.
tamu tak diundang. Selamat bekerja. Dan jangan lupa bersenang-senang. So, 2011's The Raid, with a runtime of 1 hour and 41 minutes. IMDB says that in Jakarta, Indonesia, Lieutenant Wayu organises the invasion of an apartment building that is the safe house of the powerful and cruel drug lord Tama and his gang. The SWAT team breaks in the building, but no one... Ooh. Sorry. The SWAT team breaks in the building, but one lookout sees and warns the gangsters that the police force is trapped on the seventh floor. They learn that Lieutenant Wayu has not informed his superiors about the operation. Now the police officers have to fight with limited ammunition against an armed and dangerous gang. That pretty much sums it up. Um, I mean, it, it sums it up, but it doesn't quite get it right. Because, I mean, like, <laughs> they get spotted by a spotter, but then, you know, another spotter actually rats them out. So it's actually like a series of spotters yeah. that rat them out. And, and it, it doesn't even mention that really the epic fights that go on in this movie. It doesn't. It, it, it's a bit light on. But nonetheless, we'll get to that. So uh, the rating on IMDb is 7.6 out of 10, which I thought was a little light on. And uh, it gets an R rating, which I kind of get for violence, because there is no nudity in this movie at all. Well, actually, there is an unrated version of that that you can get, I know, over here in the States on Blu-ray, which I I bought for sure. And there's a digital version of that as well. Yeah, well, I've got the the unrated version as well, so yeah. Yeah. The problem with the digital version of the unrated version of the film over here in the States is that you don't get the option to choose the original language soundtrack Uh with the original score. Mm. You get the original language soundtrack and you get the Shinoda Lincoln Park uh, fucked up, doesn't Mm. fit quite right. Trying trying to bring it to, you know, local audiences (laughs) here in the States soundtrack. It's not I I don't want to talk too awful bad about it. It's just it's not my taste. Well, it doesn't fit um, the movie. It really. No, it it does not. You, you watch it, and like I said, I've, I've watched, you know, both versions, and it, it just doesn't seem right because the soundtrack is really, uh, it's really subtle in this movie. It's not massive. It's not bombastic. It just fits. Yeah, and the Shinada Lincoln Park guys version of their soundtrack is the exact opposite of that, mm. where it's completely unsubtle, and they're trying to not only score the film, they're also trying to do sound effects with their little beep blops and bloops and noises and stuff, and it just kind of does not work for me. No. Um, I've, se- I've seen the R-rated version in theaters. That's how I first saw the film, with that soundtrack, and the violence and everything else that was happening, even though that was trimmed down, still overshadowed that i was just kind of like oh that soundtrack and then when i got my hands on the unrated version and the blu-ray and that option was to leave with the you know have the original score and the original music it is mostly like subwoofer hits and like low rumblings to let you know that something bad's about to happen almost like almost like a rumble rumble pack for like a video game you know yeah it's totally a video game movie Mm. but i mean you know what that's all it needs you know there's enough no it doesn't need anything else you're right there's enough going on in this movie and so so much going on um that you don't need you know a big score telling you what's happening because it's all there it's all on the screen um so that's probably down to the director gareth evans uh he's mostly done horror titles so i remember seeing uh the apostle and vhs 2 and obviously the sequel to this movie the raid 2 which we'll probably cover at some point but um, he was also involved in uh, marantu i think is how it's pronounced i'm not 100 percent sure but that was like the film that these same crew made before the raid oh, okay it's sort it's sort of like their bad taste before they got to do ah. you know <laughs> 
<laughs> before they before they got to do say like um uh, you know uh dead alive or as some folks know it overseas brain dead yeah yeah it, it, it's uh that's a really good analogy there so we might tap into the stars and of course uh Iku Uwais, which is rama is the uh indonesian actor best known for this and its sequel as well as the recent tv series Wu assassins uh which i think was a netflix series which was pretty good Oh, I'll have to check that out. Uh, he also had a brief cameo with the gentleman who plays Mad Dog in this in The Force Awakens. Ah, there you go. I'm not a, I've, I've not seen too many of the more recent Star Wars movies. I know, that's terrible. Say what you will about me. Um, well, I don't have a problem with that, you know. <laughs> yeah. At least you're not extremely vocal about why you will never watch it because of SJW bullshit like some uh-huh. folks are online. Yeah, no. That's, <laughs> that's just an argument that I, I'm, I'm not even vaguely driven to have. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, okay, I don't enjoy the films that much, but I'm not going to bag on them like everybody else does. I'm just going to be like, yeah, it's not for me. Yeah, yeah. You know? look, I'll, I will watch them. You know, if someone says, oh, you know, I've got a, I've got a couple of Blu-rays you want to see and have a few beers and watch these, I'll go, yeah, okay, I'll go, I'll watch, I'll, I'll have a good time. But I'm not going to, yeah, that's not a, a, a hill I'm going to die on. Yeah, it's not worth the fight. No, absolutely. So, uh, speaking of people that get into a fight, we've got Joe. <laughs> Did you like that? That's a professional segue, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Joe puts a lot of mind to shame. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Taslam as Jaka, uh, also obviously an Indonesian actor, and he was in uh, a, well, another series that's just been on recently called Warrior, which was about um, Chinese immigrants in San Francisco during the gold rush, and the fight scenes in that fight scenes in that are absolutely awesome. Well, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, every single martial artist that's in this film, um, except for maybe the guy who plays Rama, who focuses in on one particular style of fighting, yeah. they have multiple styles of martial arts that they're very excellent at, oh. and really switching between them is, is excellent as well. So knowing that these actors went on to be in these incredible series after this is no shock at all. Yeah. Well, like I said, if you haven't seen uh, Warrior, absolutely worth a watch. The the fight scenes, the story, even like overall as a series it's really good it was actually based on i believe a story by bruce lee yeah i think it from what you described it may actually be his original idea of what kung fu should have been yeah i, I think so. i may be speaking out of turn of that but that's from what i've read from bruce lee's past um just various things that seems like that was kind of what his idea was going to be for when he was going to do the kung fu series yeah well like i said if you haven't seen it uh ladies and gentlemen well and truly worth a watch and finally that brings us to donny Alam Sa, who is Andy, uh, and he's obviously another Indonesian actor because this is an Indonesian movie. And he really only did this. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, only really did this and its sequel. Um, given that obviously the bulk of the cast, well, all of the cast are Indonesian, there's not a lot of, um, I suppose, internationally known names on this one other than probably those three. And if they do get internationally known, it's essentially from this these two series of films that yeah. got them known because this is pretty much, I mean, I don't want to be offensive about it, but it's pretty much what put Indonesian filmmaking on the map for a lot of folks. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I suppose really when you think about it, once upon a time, you know, Indonesia, the Philippines in that part of um, the Pacific was really only known for, you know, the the exploitation films in the 70s. Yeah, I mean, Roger Corman's factory going over there and making like the big birdcage and stuff like that. I mean, Machete Maidens type documentary. That's mm. what we knew of it. And it kind of died off for a while until this film. I mean, like, I can't really recall something that made it or became acclaimed enough to where movie fanatics like ourselves were mm. even talking about Indonesian film outside of the that era of making it. Yeah, well, Indonesia has a fair amount of political unrest. Um, and it's understandable that it was probably not all that popular with, with Western, uh, producers, but to see something come out of there that is homegrown is, you know, absolutely fantastic. So this was, uh, originally released in Indonesia in 2012. Um, oh, sorry. This version was given a limited re-release in 2012. I'm talking crap. Uh, but that's okay. That's big. yeah. It was the edited one with the new uh, soundtrack from yeah, the, Shinada yeah, and yeah. the Lincoln Park guys. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to mention that. I'm going to cut that bit out because it's garbage. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can do that. This 
So, uh, we were talking, obviously, about the editing and the R-rated version. So, the R-rated version is apparently cut in two places. Once during the earlier execution scene, and again at 48 minutes to reduce a bloody stabbing in the neck, the R-rated cut version was cut in the film and distributed to countries for theatrical showing. It was later released unrated, uncut, on DVD and Blu-ray in the US, which is the version that clearly both of us have. It's my preferred version, as we've already discussed, yeah. Look, you give me an unrated version of just about anything, and I will throw money at you. It's usually not better, because there was a time when they would throw in something they chopped out for no reason, and not because they were forced to for mm. like censorship, yeah. and then calling it unrated just to get you to double dip. But in some cases, whenever you know for sure that it was cut back just for an R rating, go back, go ahead and get yourself the unrated or director's cut or whatever the f- definitive version that the filmmakers intended to be released. Yeah, yeah, that that's exactly it. I mean, I, I think one of my favorites is the unrated version of Robocop, because that's awesome. Oh, yes. The original actual cut as Verhoeven and crew wanted it to be is unparalleled awesome. Yes. yes that, is, that is really, really awesome. Um, so, what have we got? Sorry, I'm just reading notes to see if there's anything actually worth talking about. So, this premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, uh, which is quite interesting. That, that's a big leap from Indonesia, you know? <laughs> To, to go, yeah, t- it's just amazing that it could get that far across the world and get that level of release. Well, I think that whenever the film was completed and they got it edited and everything was finished, it would be really remiss of whoever made that to not try and get it on some type of film festival circuit. And being able to be into TIFF is definitely a a, a win. But I mean, anyone in TIFF, if they were to see any five to ten minute clip of this film that involves not only the action, but just anything involved with the filmmaking would be really remiss to not include it because this is a triumphantly made film. Oh, yeah. And on, you know, limited budget and really, you know, not a not a, an epic by any stretch in terms of sets or design. You know, it's contained really well and done really, really solidly. And, you know, it, when you get to the, the sequel in 2014, uh, you know, again, you know, another really solid film. Now, we were talking just a couple of minutes ago about the martial arts. Now, the Indonesian martial art is known as Pencak Salat. Uh, yeah, that's what Rama practices, is yeah, it not? Yeah, that is 100% correct. And that, that is, um, it's the collective word for like basically Indonesian martial arts across that whole maritime Southeast Asia region. I mean, you can see, you know, elements of Mutai and so many other things that are in there. The punching technique that the film opens up with where he's working that body bag and just really kind of going after it is really interesting. The way that he will throw a punch and then continue to use that momentum to put an elbow right where he just had his fist oh, yeah. is really incredible stuff. It's reminiscent of like seeing Donnie Yuen just wreck people in Ip Man. Oh, very similar to that. Yeah, very similar. And I, I think uh, probably the fight sequence you see with Mad Dog later on, which we'll, we'll get to when we chat about the movie, is probably... Uh, the quintessential version of that because he just goes, it's punch, elbow, knee, kick, you know, and just slams in and really gets in there. You can see that he's just going as hard as he can. Uh, and it's awesome to watch. Yeah, he looks like the character of Sagat in Street Fighter Turbo whenever you get the ramped up, like, super fast version where he just comes at you and it's, like, all knees and elbows and, like, fists, like, nonstop. Yeah. Like, that's what it f- it looked like in that fight. Yeah, that's so now I'm thinking about Sagat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, because be- because of the influence of Muay Thai, but Sagat in Street Fighter yeah, doesn't really do a lot of Muay Thai. I mean, he does the the general stances and stuff, but he does other martial arts too. Yeah. I figured that was like the best amalgamation to kind of talk about. Yeah, and not even vaguely right. Um... <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not the one that made Sagat in Street Fighter. I'm just referencing the fighting style they put in the Turbo version. That that is true. That is true. So <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, so the, the, <laughs> the <laughs> choreography was actually led by uh, by US uh, in the film, so that explains obviously why he looks so confident in that. You know, he was doing choreography as well as um, acting in there, so that, that makes pretty good sense. And now, apparently, there was a third film considered for this series, but uh, Evans decided to not go forward with it. 
Yeah, I'm kind of a little sad about that. But at the same time, I feel like having it be a part one and a part two works a little bit better like the Street Fighter and Return of Street Fighter for Sonny Chiba. Because mm. it, it has that same kind of continuing story where, you know, you see the character get fucked over at the end and then the next movie picks up and you see how he has to dig himself out of that hole. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes good sense. And I think a third film is, you know, did be an expectation of, I suppose, ramping it up a little bit. And uh, I think if you, well, if you take it out of the environment, environment that those two films are shot in i think it'd lose something um it wouldn't have that same um you know fight to the top claustrophobic type feel that this one does well, and the second one is a complete diversion. In order for them to be able to continue with that claustrophobic fight your way out or fight your way to freedom, they had to put a lot of it into a prison. And then after that, it becomes almost like um, an undercover story, you know, where he's hiding out. And then it's like a fight for survival from this like rivaling gangs. And yeah. it's like more about a gang fight in the streets. And the film, it feels like, I mean, Raid 2 feels like Raid 2 and 3 jammed together mm. anyway. So like... I. I don't think they really needed a third one because I feel the second one's ending is very satisfying. Yeah. Listen, you watch those two back to back and you are in for a gosh darn good time. So, and you'll want to lift a lot more just to be in good shape like the <laughs> folks that are in this film. <laughs> yeah, these guys, like, you know, none of them are huge. Like, you know, none of them are Schwarzenegger level, but they're ripped. Oh, yeah. It's like wiry muscle that could just, like, snap you like a twig for no reason. <laughs> yes, and I oh, don't no, be snapped. So... <laughs> Let, let, let's just obviously we've talked back and forth about various elements of the movie so we'll just sort of go through a high level of what actually happens so rama is obviously a special uh special tactics special oh, yeah. i just woke up have you got the gel squad um <laughs> Rama is a special tactics officer and he practices Salat, as we mentioned now. He, in the opening of the movie, you know, he, he says goodbye to his father. He says goodbye to his wife, who is very pregnant. Um, and he makes... Looks like she's going to have twins or something, man. That's a big belly on that little lady. Yeah, that, there's a lot of baby. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, he says to his father uh, that he'll bring him home. Now, it's funny. The first time I, I watched this, I completely missed that element that, you know, that was that little tidbit was dropped in there right at the start. Um, and, yeah. you know, connects obviously to, to his brother, Andy, who we will see later in the movie. Um, so they, they join the team. They're in the back of the truck and the, the, the pump up sequence in the back of the truck is really good because those guys, some of them are not really happy about being there. Uh, there's a couple of guys where you can see when they're checking their equipment and um, doing the final checks on the guns. One of the guys puts his gun down and he can't stop his hand shaking. And it's so bad that he can't even grip the gun. He has to switch hands. Yeah. And then he just kind of like stuffs his hand under his flak jacket or something. And it's something that Rama ends up getting attention called to. Mm. And it's implied that Rama is one of the new guys that just joined this task force. Like he was just put there because this is a, a an assignment that's so monumental that they needed to pad out this uh, particular tactical unit with additional guys or bring on in guys from other tactical units. So Rama doesn't really have a lot of friends that are in here. It's like him and his one buddy are like the two new guys that get brought in of like, say, like four or five. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, they're going up against the the, the aforementioned um, going up against the aforementioned apartment block, which is literally full of gang members, full of gangsters, as well as civilians. And it's all controlled by uh, the crime lord Tama um, and his two lieutenants Andy and Mad Dog and basically they they let like criminals and junkies and you know, drug labs uh, as well as like you know obviously poor people live in the apartment block and you know they pay him rent and obviously he provides protection and all that sort of stuff and the idea is they're going to go in and try and uh, obviously eliminate him and get all the criminals but uh, little do we know and we find out later that the man in charge Lieutenant Awayu is actually on the take. It's also kind of implied that not only is Wayu on the take, but the guys in the task force know why some of the guys in the original task force that weren't the expanded crew, they know why they're there and they know that this is like a hit job. Yeah. But the only person that doesn't seem to know is the commander of the task force. Like he just gets let in hmm. when Wayu tells him finally, you know, yeah, nobody knows that we're here. This is the off the books kind of job that we're doing here. Mm. Yeah. It, as you mentioned, I think because they'd sort of mixed units to drag them all in there, obviously there was a, a bit of just 
go in and do what you're told to do. Um, so, you know, they get in, they're relatively undetected, which is, you know, they're quite sneaky and they move through the, the first few floors pretty easy and they accost a, a, an innocent, uh, outside who is trying to get to his sick wife in apartment 726, uh, which, you know, we'll get back to later because he appears and <laughs> that guy is so angry. <laughs> He's so angry. <laughs> well, he's his wife is dying. He can't afford the medication to keep her keep her going and to, to make her at least comfortable. He's obviously forced to live in this building, even though he hates it because he, it's the only way he can afford the rent. He knows it's dangerous. His wife is constantly in danger, not only of dying of a disease, but of who knows what. How many times has he been robbed, you know, but from the junkies just looking to get some cash in there? And then on top of that, all he wants to do is get his wife his medication, and the cops are manhandling him and treating him like the fuck fucking pigs they are no oh, yeah but i mean look and, and you know i know how much you love uh, law enforcement uh, it, <laughs> very little actually yeah I know. <laughs> Uh, but they they make no uh, no bones about the fact that the bulk of the, the the police force is on the take. you know like you know cops just need to know it's not what you've done but how much you're willing to pay to get out of it yeah Totally true. Yeah. No, it's not all of them, but in this movie, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's just... um, yeah, I won't make declarative statements then. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, this is my show. Oh, the first set. Um, <laughs> well, you know, if they're consensual, but anyway, moving on. Um, so they, they managed to get up to, I think, about the sixth floor, and then the team is spotted uh, by by a kid who comes out of the bathroom, and there's, like, this really tense standoff where they're, like, you know, they're up one end of the hall. The little the, the kid is down the other end of the hall, and it's just, like, everyone's, like, frozen, just waiting for something to happen. And the kid bolts and slams the door and then yells out to another lookout. And we get this really cool slow-mo shot of uh, Lieutenant Wayu just, like, shooting through the door and it takes the kid out through the neck and it looks yeah as the kid's going through the door he raises the gun just to get the right height yeah. for him and he just holds it there and i always thought he was shooting through like a porthole or something that he could see the kid but no he's just going by the relative height of where this kid is and just kind of gauging from that and he nails it like he, he gets him right through the spine and the throat yeah. and it's an instant kill shot yeah. and, but like so doing it in slow-mo though i reckon really added to it Oh, yeah. I mean, it makes it that much more. But I think when you see that shot taking place, I, the reason I feel they did that in slow motion is so that you can see just where they lose control of the situation mm. because of his impulsivity. Yeah. Yeah. This this is the point where everything just tips out of control. Yeah. Uh, so let's, the, 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 the second lookout gets to, to the alarm system and alerts uh, Tama, who obviously calls in reinforcements from his uh, his bunker up on the top of the, the, the apartment with all these cameras and everything else, uh, calls in uh, snipers and thugs. And, you know, the snipers, I like the snipers just sort of casually walk up to the, to the window and just peg the two cops that are downstairs. One of them who's left, like, not dead, but in agony, and he just says, no, let him scream. And you can just hear this guy just bellowing in agony. Yeah, and the reason they did that is because they wanted to have cops or somebody else look out the window so they could pick them from across the way. Oh no! Is that like a is that like a garage that they're in, like a parking garage that is for that housing block tenement that they're all in? I think so. It's, I mean, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, you, it's an abandoned building at the least, or, yeah. or something that is completely empty. And just the way those blocks go on the side, it's for airflow, and that's why I thought it might have been a parking garage. It's really hard to tell. I mean, Indonesia is really hot, like <laughs> really, really hot. <laughs> So, you know, it, it may have been that, I don't know, that was an open area or, you know, it was a patio or something. Don't know, but it, it's a, whatever it was, they used it well and truly to their advantages. So, um, Tama cuts off the lights, announces over the PA that they've gotten intruders, and this is where everything cranks up to 11. So there's like just shooting and gun fights and you know the the team just get massacred to to a certain yeah. degree. It's a uh, 15 I I timed it today when I was watching it. It starts at like about 18 minutes and it ends about 35 minutes. So it's about 15 to 17 minutes of just cop slaughter. Yeah. And them fighting for their lives to get out and just watching like machete maniac drug addicts just go after these guys at the promise of free rent. Yeah. And it's just so brutal and violent and there's it just keeps ratcheting up to the point when they finally get broken up and you finally see some of the the survivors of the police that just get 
a moment to catch your breath, you know, like they're 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 finally in a, a place where you don't have to worry about them or whatever. You're just kind of sitting there and you, you realize that like you're not breathing either because yeah. it's just like so intense. Yeah. And, you're like, and, oh shit, I should probably start breathing yeah. again. That, that's right. Just, just, just I can relax. I, I can unclench everything and uh, I'll be okay because my my wall door and everything else is not going to be like riddled with bullet holes. And I love the fact that obviously because it's such a cheap, shitty apartment, you know, the walls and everything are super thin. So when they start shooting through, like everything just explodes out. You know, it's not just shooting through the door, it's shooting through walls, it's shooting through absolutely everything. Um, and then, you know, you get to the point where um, I think it's it's Bowo, Jaka, Wayu and Dagu, as well as Rama, uh, they get cornered in an apartment and, you know, trying to find the escape route and like, Rama's like banging on the floor and he hears a hollow point and gets the breach axe and axes away through the floor to the to the, the apartment below. Yeah, and not only does he axe his way through, he does it in record speed time. It's terrifying to think of what could he do with the breech axe and a human body that quickly. Oh, yeah, and, you know, like, he's doing it, and like, everyone's going, hurry up, hurry up, and there's, like, you know, more cops are getting shot through the wall and the doors, and, you know, it's it's really, again, it's the intensity that goes with the action sequences in this movie is just amazing. Um, So, you know, like... The, the refrigerator trick that they're doing to try oh. and buy themselves time where they, they throw the grenade in the refrigerator to blast it out at the door the folks that are there that, is, that was incredible too you know <laughs> rips the gas cylinder off the wall stuffs it in the refrigerator whacks it up against the door drops a grenade in the refrigerator turns it towards the door door out and the the explosion that goes with that is just oh so good <laughs> so, and, and you know it gives them like this really, really small point in time to be able, obviously, you know, escape and and recover and, and you know get through. And this is the point where the, the two groups split up. Um, and then you know you've got uh, Rama and Boa, who Boa is obviously really badly injured. Um, you know they decide that they're going to go and try and find Route Seven Twenty Six, where we, we met that person earlier, uh, and try and hide there. And then Jaka, Dagu, and Wayu um, obviously try and retreat to the fifth floor and. So this is the bit, the bit where it sort of splits up. Now, the sequence here, it's about 38 minutes um, where they're fighting their way to room 726. This is, without a doubt, my favorite fight in my movie. The part where Rama is holding his friend up and he's got the baton for the police, the spinning baton, like nightstick thing, yeah. and then like a dagger. And he's taking on that hallway of guys on the seventh floor, oh. um, trying to hold his friend up at the same time. Then they've all got machetes. If that's the sequence you're talking yes, about, it's that... my favorite as well. Oh. That fight is so brutal and so intense and so amazing. Because, you know, he's he's punching, he's kicking, but he's also stabbing at the same time. And it's, you know, it's and it's like stab into the leg and... And rip down into the knee like it's not just a, a stab and fall down it is like a real brutal bloody stab and tear a, as well as punching and kicking like so that goes on i think for a solid five minutes uh and yeah and there's one sequence where he opens up um the main artery in the one dude's leg the one that runs down your leg that you'll bleed out in instance that's the one you're talking about where he stabs at the hip and then drags down yes he's opening that vein just to make sure that that guy dies that fast oh. he does the same thing to a guy's arm mm. um where he goes down the, the middle of his arm like opening up veins like he is doing kill strikes in like vulnerable and open areas that he knows that they'll bleed out instantly when he does that and there's a few folks where he's trying not to kill them but the ones that are like dead set crazy on killing him i think he like he knocks them down and like basically breaks something that they keep going then he kills him yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so brutal and i gotta talk to like his friend that gets shot the blood coming out of him that's like super dark and black where he gets liver shot mm. that is super gross like you can see the bile in the other part <laughs> yeah, like, as well it's and just... it's leaking out of him while he's dragging himself across the floor and like you see all this other blood and you're just like what diseases are you guys getting infected with just trying to make it out of this hallway alive oh and, and that's it you can only imagine you know what's on the floor and, and, and everything else that that's there oh, or on the machetes that are coming their way and oh. slicing at them and stuff like who else got stabbed and you know that machete wasn't cleaned off after oh, that yeah you, you're getting you're getting every version of hepatitis you can ever imagine uh <laughs> and, and plus a few bonuses to go with it i reckon 
<laughs> yeah, it's just, oh, just those kinds of like germaphobic thoughts that went through my head watching it this time. I was like, oh, God, what are they getting infected with on top of this? Like, even if they survive, this is probably still a death sentence, just a much slower one. Yeah, it, it's a creeping death. There's no two ways about it. So um, they eventually get to 726 where, you, you know, they they basically force their way in um, and they, you know, they, they have to hide because the gang's coming. There's five machete wielding guys coming to look for them and they they track them into them and they they very smartly hide in a false wall which i'm there again claustrophobic like there's just enough room for them to squeeze in after the the resident like but hooks out a section of the wall and and just stuffs them in there you know the room's getting i feel like that wall he put in there himself to hide himself and his wife whenever residents are getting crazy and ransacking places or whatever yeah and for whatever reason he's hiding them there this time yeah or or likes to hide his valuables (laughs) because you know he made it pretty clear that he didn't really have much well, that, that apartment before he moved in there as well, that could have been a drug stash room, and that's why that false wall is there. Yeah, you don't. You don't know. But listen, you know, the, the five guys come in, they, they trash the room, they threaten to kill his wife, um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the guy that's in charge of it goes, what's going on with the wall? Flicks everything off and just starts jamming his machete through the wall. And you can see it getting, like, doof, through the wall, doof, through the wall, getting closer and closer to, to Rama. Right up to the point where he jams in and it slices into his face. And he's just- yeah, that <laughs> sequence. Oh, God. When he gets the blade and it goes into his cheek like it does and his face is right up against there and he's got no room to move is so cringy, man. <laughs> yeah. Listen, oh, I actually like rubbed my cheek when he did it. <laughs> just sort of go, no, that didn't happen to me. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like right on his cheekbone, right yeah. below his eye socket, like an inch higher and he would have lost his eye. Yeah. A li- an inch lower and it may have lost his life. Like it was just perfect. Yeah. And, you know, at, at that point, you know, the the leader gets distracted and he manages to obviously um you know not pry it or anything else but even when the guy comes to take his blade back he's holding his fingers on the blade so there's no blood on it when the guy draws it out and i'm just there going oh I, I could almost feel it grinding on my cheekbone yeah and he's so good at holding that that look of pain and that wince as they're doing it and it you really really feel it the whole time when and they just leave the blade there and you just see him like trying to like maybe sort of pull his face away but he just doesn't have the room to move so he's got to just leave that blade grinding up against his cheekbone while it's stuck in the wall and the guy goes on a little bit of a diatribe at the at the guy who runs the that or at the apartment guy yeah it's actually his his apartment for like it feels like 20 minutes but you know it's not it's just like it feels like it's forever just because you're sympathizing with rama having that blade in his face you're just like oh just take the machete out yeah, already just, just take it out take it out um so you know eventually gets out and you know they they go the gang goes and looks for other other places um they take boa out um and rama leaves him there with with a couple after obviously trying to fix his wounds uh, and digs digging the bullet out with i think the end of a spoon or something and even that in itself i'm looking at it going oh that just had to hurt just and he and Bo, oh, sorry, Boo screams like, and the screaming he has when they dig in to get the bullet out is just gut turning. That's where the blood really starts getting kind of greenish, oh, and you can see yeah. some of the the contents of the liver spewing out with the blood, and it's really gross. And the right color balance, it just, it just, oh, just talking about it now, man, it makes me queasy. Like yeah. the pain that I'm experiencing watching that. Yeah, that's you're almost tensing up, just just going, no, 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 don't take it out. Um, so you know, he does that. He then uh, Rama then heads out, and obviously to search for Jaka's group, and he cross paths with the Machete Gang. Um as he's running to the eighth floor and the fight here which is listen uh it's about sort of 51 through to about 53 minutes into the movie um there's a couple of spots on this that are so good uh the the guy that he kicks over the balcony and uh, who snaps oh, his yeah snaps his <laughs> back on the uh, on the on the wall there it's just like oh <laughs> Uh, you can kind of notice the CG that they did for that, but I'm just glad that Indonesia is not breaking backs just to make movies like they used to do in the 70s. Well, yeah, that's exactly, there, there's probably a half a second where, where you, I think if you if you watch it back, you'll see it. But in that yeah. moment, it, it's just like, oh, it's just, oh, yeah, I've got to stretch. I've got to stretch now. And It yeah. took me four times or five times watching it before I noticed the CG that made that work. So, I mean, it took me that long before the visceral reaction of that back snap was able to 
to be subsided enough to actually see how they did it. Yeah. And um, the other one that really stands out is the guy who has his face jammed into the bro- the stump of the broken door. Uh, it's just- oh, yeah, that backwards jump, and then he yes. pulls his neck over it. Yeah, yes. that's so great. <laughs> The one, the one I love is, um, I know this is in the other, the other fight sequence that we talked about that is our favorite, but the one where he slams the guy's head down the side of the wall and you just see the damage being done as he slams it harder and harder yeah, into yeah. the wall. Yeah. More and you don't even blood. need to see the damage on the guy's face. That's so incredible. Yeah. So, so good. Um, so this sort of obviously culminates in, in Rama fighting the leader of this group who, uh, he uses as a cushion to smash through a window and land, uh, three stories down on the fire escape and the guy's just like there and you can see him just like twitching just uh, 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 uh. oh yeah he totally crushed like at least his rib cage and broke his hips and everything else just to break his own fall on the guy that's incredible <sighs> that guy's got super crazy eyes too he's the same one that was doing the wall stabbing so yes yes it's, fit- it's it's fitting that rama got to crush his spine and the rest of him by using him to break his fall <laughs> um so it's interesting because this is the point where we, we really get to see Andy, um, who's coming down in the elevator and, you know, he's got two, two of the gang with him because he's in there to look for him and he just kills them both. Just like that. Just completely unexpected. Stabs one in the neck, stabs, uh, does he stab the other one in the stomach? I think I, the, the one for me that I remember is always the neck stab because it goes in one side, out the other and into the wall of the elevator. Yeah, he gets the other guy in the gut and basically just does like um like through the side into the kidney kill or something like that from yeah. the front of the gut. Like he does an instant stab in the gut and kills that guy. Pulls the knife out before his friend the the other guy on the other side of him can react and puts the knife blade again through the spine and the neck, like right through the center. So he gets the main arteries and veins in the neck and the spine, and then just basically the guy gets stuck in the elevator wall. I would have liked to seen him try and take the knife out and have trouble because it's stuck through all that stuff. Oh. Well, it, 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 I mean. <laughs> He, he does he, you can see it, he has to do it really slowly um I, and i'm not sure whether that was more just to prolong it or the fact that it was maybe a bit caught on the on the chunky bits not really sure but like i said it, it would have been funny if he had to put his foot up and like get a little <laughs> leverage to pull it out or something just a little bit of levity but this film gives you no levity at all it's just grim oh, as no. fuck no there is no humor in any of this um so all of a sudden you know you realize that there's something going on with with andy you don't obviously at this point in time we don't know that andy is now we cut back to the other group who um has been discovered by mad dog uh up on the fourth floor so way you runs off jaka instructs uh dagu to protect him and they go off and then jaka's left with mad dog at gunpoint and this is the bit we were talking about before um where mad dog puts his gun down and, and just basically says right we're gonna go you know hand to hand and this is about like an hour into the movie and this fight sequence mad dog is just a machine it's knees it's elbows it's punches it's so good and so fast yeah mad dog's fighting style is a really interesting combination of like uh, jujitsu throw techniques because he uses the fact that he's got this light body weight he comes at you and he does like this throw hold thing and then while he's rolling you over will like throw in punches and kicks and other types of like ground grappling fighting with his jujitsu stuff he is incredible he is so amazing yeah and you know he's not a big guy not by any stretch of the imagination now he's pretty pretty he's pretty light even for um an indonesian who are not you know gen- genetically not really you know big people but he is you know he's skinny and wiry and he's just unbelievable and like jaka who he's fighting he's you know he's padded up he's wearing a, a, a flak vest he's got all his gear on and he's a fairly solid unit yeah and i love how the guy um Jaka, when he's actually fighting Mad Dog, he does throw Mad Dog around like a ragdoll a couple times. When he gets a hold of him, he does some really great maneuvers where he's like doing almost wrestling body slams and like tossing him at shit. And seeing Mad Dog recover midway through and do like some kind of like tumbling motion as he's being thrown away to land the way that he wants to and come back at him is nightmare fuel. Oh, yeah. And and that that final end where Mad Dog just snaps his neck, that ultimate insult, and, and you just see him go limp and go, like I, I know for me that was another one where I was holding my breath and and as he snapped his neck it was just like oh 
You can see where the fun of being in the fight wears off on Mad Dog, where he's had enough and he's like, yeah, you don't have anything for me. This is over now. Yeah. He just kind of pauses for a moment and you see him like take a breath and he just kind of looks up or looks around. And you just see it where he's just like, oh, the joy of this has gone out and this total ennui. And there's nothing left to do but just to kill the opponent and move on. Yeah. And it's even more horrifying just to see that like total lack of humanity come over his face when the actor who plays Mad Dog is really excellent at doing that like just not their killing machine look mm. and he, he just comes at you all teeth claws elbows fists and knees man he's just he's insane i've never seen anything like that before this film so good um and he takes the the body of um drags him uh up to the elevator to obviously take him back upstairs to to show him to tama and uh we now get a sequence where andy is you know revealed to be the estranged brother of rama and they have a a, a touching interaction um because rama really only came to obviously try and save him and bring him back although andy is really clear that it's just like you know what this is who i am i'm a criminal i'm good at it and um i'm not going i'm not leaving uh you know why would i go back to my family who really pretty much disowned me and, and um you know don't believe in me and it's just like cool there's a little bit of sibling, uh, sibling rivalry there, too, where he's like, you were the favorite one. You know, mm. your dad loved you more. You get that in, like, what he's saying there. Like, why are you coming to get me when he has everything he wants with you? He doesn't want me. Like, that's it's not necessarily directly said, but it's heavily implied in the way that they're having that discussion and yeah. that sort of, like, brother-sibling rivalry thing that they've got going on. And it's really incredible how quickly they're able to put that aside in the film, yet it's still very much there. It's like, you can't kick the shit out of my brother only i can kick the <laughs> shit out of my brother <laughs> ah that's exactly how it works you did no, no one gets to beat up my family but me exactly that's exactly what you get with these two once they get teamed up yeah so um andy leaves uh, leaves rama and decides to head back upstairs and Ma he meets up with mad dog who's you know dragging um Jaka's body back upstairs and I, this is the point where like I said Mad Dog is thinking well how come Andy's by himself what's going on uh, they head upstairs to the surveillance room to, to see Tamara up at the top of it and in between that uh, Rama regroups with Dagu and Lieutenant Wayu uh, in I think it's apartment 403 Tama clearly knows that something's going on. You know, he, he says, to, says to Andy, show me your hands. And he holds him out and says, no, nothing there. He says, turn him over. He says, no, no, you've come back to me empty handed. And it's just like, <laughs> and it's just like, well, yeah, I got that. And after seeing Tama like execute those five guys at the very start of the movie, he is one of them with a hammer just because yes. he ran out of bullets. Yes. He's, he's, he's just a cold motherfucker. He's like clearly just. He's a killer. No two ways about it. And, you know, he shows Andy the video uh, that he's recorded of him helping his brother. And this is the point where Latama stabs him through the hand onto the table and then just says, gives him the mad dog to torture. And that hand stab again, I, I was doing hand flexes <laughs> just to go, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. I don't know what it is about how they shoot it other than th they don't do the normal like um, you see the attack of the knife coming in. They really go on the element of surprise where if something bad like that happens to you where you have grievous bodily harm that is completely out of the blue, they film it in such a way that it replicates that to where you have that same visceral reaction of holy fuck and you are. You're checking your hand when that stab does happen. It's true. Yeah, it's the, the editing on this is so quick. Like I said, you know, as you said, it's, it's that element of surprise. You know, it's not a big sort of throw in, watch the knife, watch the hand, watch the eyes. It's just, boom, there it is. And it catches you by surprise every time. But it's not too quickly edited like a lot of the modern action films where you can't see the actual strikes happening in the martial arts. It's only for things like this where it's supposed to be an element of surprise where it's a surprise hook that catches somebody, a surprise stab or, you know, a gun comes out of nowhere and blows their brains out. It's they use it judiciously. It's not like this ridiculous modern day action film overly edited style. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's not like a, a, a gun foo type stuff where it's just flickety, 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 flickety flickety flick and you've sort of got to stop and go i think that was cool i'm not really sure i couldn't follow it it's just it's surprise it really is it, it's that real it, it's almost um it's almost jump scare level yeah it does it has that uh jump scare horror feel and then when they're filming the actual martial arts fights 
they hold on them in such a way where it's almost like a traditional style of kung fu, but they just allow the actors to move quickly where they couldn't capture it on film that way in the earlier days of kung fu. Mm. They they actually they film a lot of it that way. I noticed that where I don't know if they did the same kind of editing in camera techniques where they would just film the stuff that they knew they wanted in the final sequences for the fights or not, but it really does feel like the classic style of martial arts that you would have gotten like in a five deadly venoms the way that they shoot it where it's all in one frame of a shot where you're seeing the fights with some background actor fighting as well but the stuff that you're supposed to focus in on is pretty much dead center static in the camera and like the rule of thirds style you seeing all of that action with a few things in the background to kind of catch your attention and then whenever somebody fucks up and it's like a death blow then they do that jump scare edit that you know that person's dead yeah and it's so startling that that's that's how it would be for you you never see the one that's getting you yeah that's exactly it yeah so anyway so Speaking of things that you don't expect, you know, they start, Rama and, and Wei, you start finding their way up um, because they've worked out the only way out is, like, was it through like the 15th floor, um, I think from memory, and they go through uh, the narcotics lab and, and the fight, there's a, you know, huge fight in the narcotics lab. And again, a lot of like people being smashed on tables halfway across and like bending the wrong way. I also loved Yu's fighting style. It's very reminiscent of the Scottish fuck you, where he does a lot of headbutting and kicking on the ground. Uh, his big hero moment is when he takes that steel frame chair and knocks that guy charging at him right off his feet by swiping him. Like he hits him like right across the like the hips and the legs, and the guy does an inverted fall where he hits the ground like neck and shoulders first, like the the typical like uh, Iron Cross style yeah. hit for a wrestling move. Yeah. Where like if you do it right, you're fine, but if you do it wrong, you're crippled. But the guy lands it like when he gets hit like that and then why you just takes the time he brings the chair over his head and does like this total like hardcore scream and brings it down and you see the chair just kind of like bounce but you don't see it actually hit the guy and you know that dude's dead you know he just got beat to death with a steel frame chair yeah yeah he's just had everything caved in or broken and, and bone through organs he is completely ruined one of the highlights of this fight, too, that's really cool that's in the drug lab is they use the uh, classic Kung Fu, like Jackie Chan thing, where you get hit so hard the, the dust comes flying off of you. Yeah. But in this case, it's drug powder, <laughs> yeah. where the guys are getting thrown through drug powder and then they get kicked and you see, like, whatever drug it's supposed to be. I'm assuming it's either heroin or, like, coke or something. But, like, you actually, you actually see, like, the white powder getting kicked off of guys when they're coated in it when they get thrown into the stuff and then hit. Yeah. And it's a really neat way of doing that classic technique. Yeah, it's really awesome it's probably heroin given that it's indonesia um but yeah it's just so good yeah so anyway so um the, you know they get through the lab and they get separated briefly because rama hears um someone being tortured and he works out that it's andy and you know he goes into the room like, looks through the window and he can see mad dog torturing andy like you know he's up on chains he's really get it Dago and way you run up the stairs like it's pretty clear that the way you doesn't give a shit about anyone but himself well, yeah, I mean, he brought these guys in off the books just specifically to do a black ops mission that he needed to ax somebody out who happens to be the main guy in charge. And he wants to do that job so he can go back and do what he needs to do. And that's literally all he cares about. And everybody else is just a means to that end. Yeah, he, he, he's busy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, he's not only corrupt, but, you know, he's he's corrupt enough that he's willing to like let innocent men die. <laughs> Just to, to meet his own ends. That's just shitty. Well, if you were over here in America, you'd be used to that from our politicians. So, you know, you just know that that's how people can be sometimes. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, so we eventually, Mad Dog lets Rama go free and decides that, again, he's going to fight the two brothers um, at the same time. So we're about like one hour 25 into the movie here. And this is a really good, again, another good fight sequence. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. And like through most of the way, uh, like Mad Dog has the upper hand. But it, it yeah, he, he, he handles the, both of them. Yeah, oh, right. He, yeah, go on. Go ahead. I was going to say he handles both of them like it's nothing, and he's totally toying with them and playing with them, and they, they got nothing. Even when they try to team together to like the one sequence I'm thinking about, like uh, one of them is holding his legs and the other one's trying to choke him out. Yeah, and like they can't even contain him doing that, where they're both literally holding him down. 
It's just crazy. Right up to the point where um, he gets a fluoro tube smashed over his head and, and it ends with Rama stabbing him in the neck with the fluoro tube and dragging it. Not not cutting, dragging the jagged fluoro across his neck to kill him. It is so good. It's really interesting how it works, too. Like, th- I think they got lucky. They were not going to beat him. He was going to kill them both. Yeah. But he just got so involved with his particular fetish of snapping a neck is like a final insult. Like, you couldn't even defend yourself to where I was able to do this light neck snap to kill you. Yeah. And he was getting ready to do that on Rama because Rama's a cop and he's not done torturing the other guy. And he was so distracted with that that Rama's brother, Andy, was just basically able to jam that in. And this fight sequence where the blood is spitting out of that fluorescent tube yeah. as he's battling with them yes. and you see him like you see him losing some energy because he's clearly slowly bleeding out but he's still got the upper hand and he's still going to win and like they can tell so like they still have to work together and until they start actually like really working on just trying to get that tube to get more blood out like that's all they're doing is they're trying yeah. to run out the clock to get him to bleed down enough to where they can finish him I mean these guys got fucking lucky that mad dog got as careless as he did in that brief second yeah yeah and that that's it but let's and, and you can see that the way like when he when he just rips it through his throat it's just like no nah, this this has to end it's just really you know that it's been a grueling bloody fight and he's just gonna have to, to well put a mad dog down yeah, and the drag across is so fucking visceral, and the actors all do this really good job of selling it. Yeah. The actor playing Mad Dog, the the gurgly weird noises and the twitchy stuff that he's making while the other guy is holding him down, while Andy's holding him down just to be able to make it to where Rama can rip the, the fluorescent tube across his throat. And just the motion that Rama's doing where, like, it's not like he's hesitant to do it. It's just like showing just how difficult it is yeah. to try and slash someone's throat with a broken fluorescent tube. I mean, it's it's just so visceral and so grody. And you still see the blood kind of spitting up out through the tube as he's dragging it across, which makes it even more disgusting and awesome. Yeah, exactly. And awesome. <laughs> now, speaking of things that are less <laughs> awesome, <laughs> go on. <laughs> No, go on. What were you going to say? It's like... Oh, I was just going to... I just... All I had to say is, like, that is the most horrific moment I've ever seen, and it's not even in a horror movie. <laughs> no! No, exactly! It, it, it's not even... Yes, yeah, in the hands of a Jason. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, like, Wayu and Dayu confront Tama, um, you know, after killing off his remaining henchmen, uh, and this is the point where Wayu shows his full-on betrayal. He shoots Dagu in the face! And then, you know, tries to take Tama hostage, uh, and what it was going to use him as a shield to try and, you know, get out. And, you know, they're heading down the stairs and they encounter, you know, the, the bloody and beaten Rama and Andy, uh, going down the stairs. And, and like, Tama is just like, he doesn't care. He's like, literally, he's taunting Wayu to, to say, you know what? Didn't matter what you did. You thought you were coming to get me. As it happens, I paid off people well above you and you are a lamb to the freaking slaughter. And the look on his face is just like everything. It's just, he, he's lost absolutely everything. It's pure despair. I actually got the inclination from what uh, Tama was saying is that the people that he works for that are actually in charge, like the government officials that are higher up than all of them that are crooked, have decided that it's time for Wayu to be done. And the whole reason that Wayu was sent there, you know, under the premise that he's supposed to kill Tama is actually the reverse, that he was supposed to go there to be killed. Yeah. And it was all a big setup. And he even tells him, he's like, it doesn't matter. Even if you kill me, once you leave, you've got, you've got no recourse. Yeah. They're going to take you out. Like, you're done. He's like, I don't care if I live or die. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I've already been paid. The money's already spent. Yeah. He's like, I've already enjoyed the money that I was supposed to get to kill you. So if I don't succeed, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I mean, that's the point where you just like, he kills him and, and attempts to kill himself. And I, and I love the fact that he's there. You know, he's, he's had enough. He, he's like shakingly going to like blow his own head off and he's out of well, and what's really funny is if he wouldn't have wasted that shot at uh, the two brothers as they're coming up the stairs, if he would have just told them to stay back, he would have had more than enough bullets. Yeah. So, fuck you. Uh, f- sorry. <laughs> fuck, fuck you, Tama, and fuck you, why you? Yeah, like, I actually really like the way that Tom you, or Tama dies. He dies like a mob boss yeah. should, where he's just like, I've had it all, I've got it all, and fuck you. Yeah. It's just really awesome. Yeah, you've got nothing, you are nothing. Uh, so. 
So we're now obviously, you know, getting to the, the, the very close of the movie. Um, Andy uses his influence to, to get, to allow Rama to get out and take the injured Bo Wo, um, while detaining Wei Yu. Um, you know, obviously all the, all the gangsters in the building know Andy. So, you know, he's one of the, one of the, the sub bosses. So they allow him to, you know, get through. Um, get through the rest of the building and head out to the gate. Andy also hands over, um, I think Tama had his emergency blackmail kit and who doesn't? Um, and to obviously, you know, put, uh, put way you will and truly behind bars where he won't last long. Not in an imagination, ladies and gentlemen. Um. <laughs> Well, well I, I also kind of I got the inclination here um, that once Andy saw that the cops were raiding the building, he saw his chance to step up and yeah. take Tama's place. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that he was going to do with that is that blackmail kit is going to assure that the folks that were going to be coming after him for Tama's death or be, having a role in that are going to be gone. And any of the people that may know that Rama is brothers with Andy, they're also dead now, too. Yeah, that's so, it. He's free. It's it's not yeah. It's not just him trying to protect his brother, and it's not this altruistic thing where he's like, "Here, this is everything you need." There's a second motivation that's a lot more nefarious in what Andy's doing, and if you, you really can kind of tell when you're looking at it, what that's what he's doing. Yeah. Oh yeah. He he is he's made it to the top of the world, and he couldn't be happy. All because his brother would dare to try and come save him in this raid. Yeah. And um, the movie ends basically as as Rama and, and the other two cop Bowo and Wayu walk out through the gate to, one might say, an uncertain future. And as you mentioned, we learn what that future is in the raid too. And here I'd like to point out that the original Indonesian soundtrack, the music that swells up and it gets all certain like hardcore metal and cool yeah. is really fitting with that because it does like after all of that dread, it gives you this sense of release. But at the same time, you're watching them walk out of the gate and you just want to know like, well, what's going to happen now? Yeah. Like, cause this film has constantly left you surprised and you're like, oh shit, oh shit, what's going to happen now? And then you just see him go through the gate and the film just ends and you're like, oh, oh shit, what, what's going to happen to them? <laughs> yeah. But, but, yeah. But, 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 but what now? <laughs> and yeah, and, I and, want more. Tell me what happens. Please tell me. Yes. You don't get a, a, a convenient credit sequence that says two years later, Andy died in prison of syphilis. Um, <laughs> that's not him. But uh, that is the end of the movie. It is freaking awesome. So uh, we mentioned it earlier, but my favorite scene in this entire movie has to be uh, the fight sequence uh, at uh, around 38 minutes where they're, they, Andy's, sorry, Andy, Rama is working his way through the apartments. That is absolutely. Yeah, especially when he a lot of the fight choreography is him trying to support his friend who can't stand on his own yeah. and fighting off the guys. And he's like hitting him, like he'll push his friend against the wall and stand there and hold him and then like fight guys off and then turn around and do the other thing or just basically be fighting some of the guys one handed and they're all coming at him with machetes. The choreography in that is just unbeatable. Uh, the other fights do escalate and it does build up from there and it does get more intense. But for my money, that is some of the best choreography and fighting in the entire film. Yes. Now, as the listening public will know this is normally the point where I would play that scene unfortunately there's just a lot of yelling slamming shooting and stabbing um so I might just, just go play. watch the movie yeah go watch the movie it's great <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play it trust me it's freaking awesome um now getting to the final section of this who was your leader of the pack who was who was the standout for you in the movie mate I actually have two, one on both sides, for the cops and then for the bad guys, okay? Yep. Because you, you have to recognize. Now, on the cop side, it's definitely Rama. Rama is the one who carries the film, oh, yeah. and because of his fighting ability, like, he makes this film so worth watching. Now, on the villain side, or the, the, the side that we're not supposed to root for, because we're following Rama the whole time, is Mad Dog, oh, because he yes. is absolutely terrifying, and the only reason he was defeated is sheer dumb luck. Yeah, absolutely. Fully agree on that one i had rama and mad dog as well because ugh, listen the mad, mad dog's fighting style is awesome and, and rama you know outside of the fact if you just immerse yourself in this the fact that he survives all of this is just amazing well, yeah, and he's a fucking rookie pretty much on this team. They they make sure that they point that out to you. So, like, he is the most MVP rookie of all time. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Now, uh, for a rating, I have given this four and a half out of five. What about you, mate? Oh, this is a solid five out of five. This is my favorite pretty much action movie of all time, um, closely followed by The Raid 2. Like, there is, if you want to watch an action movie in my house, this is the movie I'm playing for you. Yeah, damn skippy. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us. Would you like to tell the listeners where they can find a Cinema Psyops? 
Easiest place is the main landing and launching page, legionpodcasts.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. We're in all of the podcatcher areas or the various pod uh, services that you can get your hands on. Real easy to find with the search for cinema psyops. We're on Facebook there as well. If you do a quick Google search, just make sure you do cinema psyops in the Google search. We're going to pop up somewhere. Um, It's easy to find. And uh, in the Apple podcast, if you just search cinema with a space, we are the fourth entry down, I believe, still well done <laughs> yeah i'm still super happy about that <laughs> very impressive all right coming up on our next episode in two weeks time we'll be looking at another pair of brothers killing gangsters in 1999's the boondock saints remember be a good fellow and leave a review on whichever app you're using to listen to the show and make sure you share it with the rest of your gang on twitter facebook and instagram as goh pod and at www.gohpod.com most of all make sure you say hello to your little friend for me and remember you're blood in blood out on this show 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 blood in blood out on this show